Hi, this is Mark the Techno Bear, and welcome to a video where I'm going to show you the Squarp Hypax. I've been a fan of uh, Squarp uh, sequencers for quite a while, actually, so I'm really excited to actually show you this. This is their uh, brand new sequencer, um, and it's a bit of a beast. There's an awful lot to get through in this video. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is to uh, walk through kind of making a track, uh, but show you loads of the different features that it's got and little tricks and stuff that I've learned whilst I've been using it. Um, so it's going to take a while, uh, but sit back, enjoy, perhaps go out, grab a coffee or two, and um, I hope you find something useful in it. Okay, so let's get ourselves familiar with the Apex and what's going on. So let's have a look, a look at the hardware first of all. So on the top here, we can see we've got MIDI in. We've got two ports, one TRS, one DIN. We have four outputs, um, which are the MIDI. The TRS uh, one is on the fourth one and three MIDI DINs. We have CV input and output, CV outputs and respective gates, which we can use independently. For example, we can use these for modulation and just trigger outputs. Then we have um, a pedal input here. And then we also have USB device and host for MIDI as well. And then we finally have the power and a nice on off switch, thank God. And then a C the SD card here, which is used to store projects and update the firmware. On the panel itself, obviously the main part we see is the great eight by 16 grid. Uh, which can be used for programming steps. Um, it also is a nice playable surface, so we can actually use it to play notes and inputs. We then um, have obviously the main two displays here. So the way this works is that the right display here tends to be more of an overview. It's like piano views and used for menus and is used with this encoder here. Then this side is actually used for all the parameters. There's quite often eight parameters and we have eight encoders. So if we come over to here, we can see that this one matches to this one. They're push encoders and they have a bit, a slightly temp, but nothing particular, not really strong, but you can feel it. Uh, usually the function is uh, hold it down and it'll reset it. Then down here, we have uh, obviously the transport buttons. We have an ability to copy and paste things here, uh, which is actually also related to this side here where we can actually select rows um, and we can also select the entire grid as well, so we can copy and paste things. Um, we have the algo button, which we will come on to later, and then a uh, secondary button here. There aren't that many second functions, but um, this is where we click onto here. Then along the top, we have uh, the track buttons, and we have uh, a mute ability here, which this does group mute. So for example, we can select them, and only when it's released will it actually mute them. Then on this side, we have more of the function kind of buttons. On this side, obviously we have the, one of the key points here is we actually have two projects which can run simultaneously, or we can be doing things like playing one project and loading the other. And these are selected by here. This is also where we get the project options if we hold it down. Um, we then have the four main modes, which we're gonna go into, which is the live playing mode, uh, step sequencing mode, uh, the automation mode, this is where we can program automations of effects and also CTs, etc, etc. And then we have the pattern mode, and this allows us to actually build up um, pretty much like Ableton, like clip kind of functionality. But it's also where the song mode lives as well. Uh, then further down, we have uh, settings, um, the effects, and uh, things like fills, BPMs, etc. And then more navigation functions down here. Those we'll all kind of get into as we go through. Okay, so let's now think about how Apex works in terms of project structures, etc. So the top level is projects. We have two projects which can both be running actively, or we can actually have them muted and we can load a project whilst the other one is playing. Within a project, we then have 16 tracks uh, to play with, and within each track, we have uh, eight patterns. Now, every track has the ability to have a set of eight effects, and we also have a modulation matrix for those effects. As for patterns, they can store notes, they can also store automations, but they can also uh, modulate effect parameters specifically as well, which we'll see later. Okay. 
OK, so let's start by trying to make a track. Now, I'm not really quite sure what I'm going to do here. I've got some instruments lined up, but let's uh, give it a go. So the first thing I do, I think, is I'm going to create a bass track, which I've got on. Uh, I've got a USB MIDI coming out here. Um, that's going to be on track one. Now, what I think I'm going to do, because I don't really know where I'm going to go with this, I'm going to actually use the project mode to actually start a project scale. So I'm going to actually put it in my favorite one, which is, uh, let's go for G minor. Uh, okay, let's start with that. Uh, we can also see, obviously, we can have things like um, a time signature, we can do quantization, and we can also use track 16 as a transposition track, which I'm not going to use. Now, one thing to note here, you can see now on track one that these are kind of grayed out. That's because they're now being set by the project. Um, however, we can get to the track settings here. And if we go first of all here to the track settings, we can set the input and outputs, which can be set obviously independently. Um, I'm just going to set the track to USB output one. We can also see here that we have the track length. Um, we have the ability to also use a looper, but I'm not going to do that for the moment. We can also, if we press second and uh, the track, we can come to the other options so we can rename the track and that kind of stuff. Uh, this is quite nice because this is actually quite a simple thing to actually do here. This is actually really quite easy to type these in here. That's good. I quite like that. Um, now, importantly, we can actually also turn off the project scale and the thing. So if we want to go out of scale for the project, that's easy as well. Right, OK, so let's come back to the live mode. Um, what we're going to do. I think I'm going to keep it quite slow. In fact, let's change the BPM. Let's change this down to something like I don't know, 88. I'm going to make it quite slow. And what should we do now? Right, so let's uh, let's actually program these steps um, rather than play them in, because I don't actually have any kind of thing. So as a start transport, everything can be done on the fly. Now, the way this works is you can obviously either program in the steps here. This, because it's in project scale mode, we can actually see these are already kind of quantized, as it were. These are uh, positions. So we've obviously got the same seven positions. Um, we could actually come in here and play live. Uh, by just pressing record. Or what we can do is we can put in the steps here. Yeah, I want this actually here. Oh, and we can do things here, like for example, we've got chance operations. So these are obviously the global ones. So whatever, whatever, when we press a pad here, they take what these settings are. Um, however, we can hold a pad and we can say, for example, that this is only going to happen once every four. OK, so let's now, so that's a, a, a kind of a normal melodic track. Which we can build on later, but I, I need some percussion or something to get me into the groove, really. Um, so, what we're going to do here is now we're going to go on to track two. And again, I'm going to suppose USB device two. Now, what we're going to do is rather than actually use this uh, poly mode, what we're going to actually do is to switch this into the drum track mode. We've got like MPE, we've got poly, and we've got drum mode here. Now, with the drum mode, what we have in the live play mode is we have the ability to basically press all the keys here. So we can basically do. Now, what's nice here is this is actually a velocity mode. So we can go. So that's quite cool. Um, up here, we can use the encoders to actually change the mapping if we want to. So that makes it very easy. Um, there's a UI concept here, which is basically that. If you press, if you hold down, you actually change the lower one. So we can see here we can change the MIDI channel. Um, and here we can actually change the actual note number. Uh, there's also the ability 
inside the step mode uh, to also change the uh, triggering um, number as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's do just put in something simple to start with. Okay, so now what we could do, for example, we've also got the concept of a velocity mode here. So basically, if we want these to be more kind of ghosty type kicks, we can hold down second and press here, and now it switches the view into a velocity mode, so we can actually bring these down, for example. That's a little. And, and to get that up, we press step. Okay, it's all getting very monotonous. Right, let's get some melody going here. So on the third track here again, I'm gonna open up track three. And this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some chords. So what we'll do for this is we're into the normal poly mode, but we can switch live mode into a number of different modes. In particular, we can go from scale mode into chord mode. So now this is actually chords. Now, what's interesting about the chord mode is that we have all these modifiers. So for example, here we have a power chord, so it's just gonna play the first and the fifth, or we can go into sustained chords. We can also rotate the chords, or bring them lower down. Now, these are the primary chords, so these are the ones lower and higher. And these are the seventh chords. And we can still use these in combinations as well. So for example, what I think is quite exciting about the way that this works is it actually makes entering different chord types very easily. Um, and we've got so, um, what am I looking for? Um, oh yeah, so we've got bass chords for. So these rotate chords are, these are basically doing the inversions, uh, which means that we can actually play something that sounds like as you would play it on a keyboard rather than just using the root position of chords, which is so common when you're using, se when you're using sequences. Okay, so let's uh, record something for this. What we'll do is obviously if we're doing chords, I think we're gonna need to do this over a little bit longer track. Let's stop, stop sequence for the moment. Not because you have to, but just because I'm getting a little bit bored hearing the same thing over and over again. Let's uh, use four bars. And what we'll do is we'll come into step mode and we'll actually program it here. Okay, so the way we're gonna handle this is actually, I'm gonna program this in, but I'm actually going to use the keyboard, the chord mode to do this. And the way we do this is simply, we can use this um, these keys as momentary switches. So basically we can just hold down live and it will stay kind of in step mode. We can play the chord that we want. And obviously we could add modifiers, etc. And then we come back to step mode. And the first time we actually do this, we want to press the learn button. So that basically we're saying we're going to use whatever we've come in for the keyboard. This is the same as I'll show later with an external keyboard. And then we simply just press the step that we want it on. I want this actually to last for, well, let's actually, we're gonna scale down this rather than play in 16th notes. Let's actually play this in obviously uh, bars, cause we've got four bars. And so therefore four bars, we're gonna want this into four. And so I'll just put a, a note here and we can actually play this. And then let's go up to, yeah, that sounds good to me. So let's go for, put that on five. And then we're going to do here. Oh, a switch bit. And then we're coming to, hmm. Let's take this down to two, do a quick chord change here. 
and that. back to the fifth. Obviously my levels are all over the place, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay, and now let's get cut some kind of arpeggiator going, which we're going to use on here. So again, we're going to go to track four. I'll st stop this so that you can hear me better. Um, again, we can come into USB device mode. Now we'll get on to channel four, which I've hopefully got something on. So something around there, I think. So we're going to have this as an arpeggiator. So let's put an arpeggiator in here. Not quite sure what speed I'm going to go for yet, but probably something like down. Okay, now I could obviously play this. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use the chord mode. So hey, it can do it for me. Remember, we've got the project scale set, so everything is now nicely in the scale. But remember, I could switch it out, so if I want to put in some Nice little accidentals, I could do that, but let's keep it simple. Okay, so let's see what we've got currently going on. Okay, perhaps what I could do, in fact, is actually, rather than actually play this in, well, there's another possibility. What we could do is we could come into this tra track uh, three here, which you'll remember is my uh, call track. And what we could do is actually copy that track and we'll paste that track onto four. Okay, now paste for that track four here, it starts as muted, right, let's unmute it. And then again, I'm gonna just switch that to track four. Okay, so that's good. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll go and put those arpeggiators back on. So let's see what that's. Okay, that's interesting. Now we could do things here again to spice things up. So for example, so for example, we've got this kind of like double thing going on here. Perhaps we want to create a little bit more space. So we'll say that'll only happen every now and then. Now what we can do is actually select all of the notes in that column by just high pressing two of them. Um, and then what we can do is basically set um, the uh, mass here, for example, was let's only do this once every three times. So now, now it won't happen all the time. Now, here's an interesting thing. What's going to happen with these is all of these notes are going to be played or not. Um, but we can obviously also do things like, for example, if we come down here and we look at some of these notes, what we could do, for example, is say that perhaps only the uh, the third is actually played every now and then. So we could basically reduce the chances of these, for example. And now we get something slightly different because of course the arpeggiator is going to be based on whether or not these notes are actually coming through. And simply we can come onto this one and put the chance here as well down a bit. <laughs> So now we're getting kind of some of the ideas and ideas. I want to do something with that percussion because I think there's, uh, there's a bit more that can be done here. Um, we did we only put in a couple of notes here. Let's, let's... Okay, 
perhaps what we can do with this is we can actually go and we can use one of the algorithms to start with. So let's switch over to um, step mode. We've not got anything on this high pass. So let's um, do something like, we can come into the algorithm mode here. This enables us to actually generate notes. And what we're going to do is we're going to select this row, which means to select just the hi-hats. And then I can actually bring the bent down here. And we can then just generate some hi-hats. Perhaps an open hat occasionally, but very occasionally. Now, of course, we can still edit these. So, for example, I could actually say, I don't want that one here. But I could, for example, copy that one here and paste this over here. So up until now, we've been um, using the pads on the Papex, which I say I quite like because I like the feeling of them. They're actually very nice. Um, but of course, you can connect up a, a MIDI controller. Um, I've actually connected here uh, an eerie, eerie touch by Embodden Me, uh, but obviously a normal keyboard would work as well. But you'll see later, I'm going to use this for MPE, so it's uh, pretty applicable. But this one, for example, at the moment in this mode, it's just sending out normal modes. So for example, we could play one of the tracks here. Um, the nice thing about this though is actually it's got uh, different modes that you can put it into. So for example, here, I could, it's more of like a drum pad type mode. So I could use it on this one. Like. So obviously you can get quite a lot of input from that. And then um, the big difference here, of course, is that these pads are not velocity sensitive um, or pressure sensitive. But obviously something like this has pressure sensitivity, velocity sensitivity, and uh, MPE as well. Um, I mean, and in this mode, of course, you can do uh, velocity by uh, the pads, but, it, but the pads themselves aren't velocity sensitive. Um, the other side of this, of course, is you want to use external controllers. Um, now I've got things like knobs, etc., just to control parameters. And we can do a lot of that as well inside um, Hapax as well. Not surprisingly, um, I've got a more appropriate thing. This, this allows me to do sliders, for example. But if I mute this, mute everything else at the moment and just play the R. We can see obviously that's making controls. Now, obviously we can do things like record this. So, Now you can see that's actually recording two CCs at once. So, so that's quite cool. You can get through here. Um, and then once we've got these automation lanes in, we can obviously start doing things like, we can scroll into them uh, because, um, or we can do things like, for example, uh, edit them, uh, we can do things like cut and paste them. Um, there's quite a nice feature here, which is that um, you can also, if you select all of the uh, thing, you can actually scale the input. So for example, if we do here, if you look at the curve, you can see that it's all getting a little bit less and we can move where the center point is. I find that really handy because quite often I can get, should we say, a little carried away with moving faders and knobs. And so to just kind of dial back the extremes a bit, I find that really useful. So we can do that. We can obviously also do things like add automation lanes uh, manually as well. But what I'll, I'll show you a little effect that we can do here. So for example, we've got an effect here, which is the arpeggiator. And you remember that the rates here of the, uh, we've got the ray and we've got the style here. So we can actually automate those parameters as well. So if we come back to the automation lane here, we can see we can automate using things like pitch bend, etc. But we can also come down to the arpeggiator. And for example, we could arpeggiate the rate. So 
We've got it going on currently. No change at the moment. If we hold down one of these, it actually tells us what the real value is, which is kind of fun. So we could do something like, for example, speed it up at the end. Now, again, bear in mind that all of these uh, automation envelopes or whatever you want to call them are per pattern. So we can quite easily kind of just change things for one pattern. Another thing we can actually do that's quite interesting to do with per pattern things is we can actually also change things on the effects per pattern. So if we come to this pattern here, okay, so this, this one hasn't got any automation on it because it was what I did earlier. Okay, but perhaps we want this one to have a slower, this pattern here to have a slow effect. So what we do is we come to effect, we hold down second and we press the right button. So, and then we can simply change it, change here. So now what's going to happen is if we come back to this one here, Here how we've got this, we can see the rate chain. And if I should switch to this one. Now, so we've got a huge amount of things that we can mess about with here. Um, uh, we also have, uh, which I'm not gonna go into at the moment, but uh, for example, we do also have uh, so-called global LFOs, which can be used as a target as well. Um, I think this is in here, is this? No. Uh, no, 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 not on this one. Uh, sorry, this is actually, so we also, as well as automation, I mean, there's just crazy amount of stuff in this thing. We also have the modulation matrix. So in the modulation matrix, we can also be taking in things like CC sources from here. And uh, for example, the project LFOs, which is what I was looking at. And we can also say for those, that we want to basically say, for example, I might want to go to the arpeggiators. Uh, what have I got? What have I got the arpeggiators. Mm, yeah, for example, the octave. Yeah. So now this is what's really nice here. Is this has got a really nice global display, we can actually see that the global elevator is going all over the place, but we can change its depth. We can, so we can see now it's just a little bit offset. We can obviously change its offset. And we can also just change it to a, a unipolar elevator or should I say signal? And of course we can change the signals to this. This could be a CV input, or it could be a C, or it could be a pitch bend or aftertouch. Really quite a different set of combinations. Now, the nice thing about using the project LFOs is obviously these across all of the tracks. So it's a very good way to synchronize effects. Okay, so let's look at some other aspects of things that we can do for performance or just general control. We've seen obviously that we can do things like automation per pattern. We've been able to obviously change the note patterns. We can set effects parameters per pattern. So we've got a hell of a lot of control here. But sometimes you want obviously some hands-on control. Um, so what we'll do again is mute these tracks. Select track four. Um, so the hands-on control is done by the assign button over here. And what we basically have to do is just press second and then press the encoder that we want to assign. And then we can, so what here we're doing is we're saying, what's this encoder gonna actually output? So we can output CCs directly, pitch bends. And similarly, we can control our arpeggiator or whatever other effects that we have. Again, uh, we can just press it. So for example, if we, we could just change this and say,
change the RPX to test stuff. Very nice here that it actually shows you the different values. So for example, so now if we've got this going, So you've got eight hands-on encoders here that basically are able to be assigned to CCs or effects parameters or anything you basically need to be able to use. Um, and as I say, that's on the same button as the fill button here, which we showed earlier. Other things, oh God, okay. Well, okay, so let's have a, let's have a quick look again. We'll keep it on. Let's actually use the, the base pan, in fact. Um, okay. So we're saying we like this. <laughs> and this is our, should we say, our home base of what we think is going. What we can do is we can use snapshots to basically save this and say, right, okay, I'm going to mess stuff up, but I want to be able to always come back to this position. So we press snapshot. It goes green. Now what we do, let's for example say that we're going to go to, we're going to change everything up here and we're going to use a generator to create some new notes. Oh, that's awful. Okay, back. Okay. Let's have another go. Now we like that, so we say, okay, right, snapshot it again. This is now our new base stat. Now again, this is really lends itself to the whole kind of creating new things, because now we've got this saved in this pattern, we could obviously copy this pattern, paste it down here, and now, now I might come back to the algorithm, give it another go. Okay. Yeah, okay, I like that. Um, I've, 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 actually, now actually, you notice I forgot then to press the snapshot button. So what we can do though, no problems, just press undo. That's it, we're back to what we were before. Uh, this time I press the snapshot. So we can do similar things here as well. I can obviously save the arpeggiator as a snapshot. Oh. Sorry. So snapshot and this ability to use the generators and just play with ideas means that you've got a way to get back. And of course, you've always got undo uh, to get it as well. So between that, you can actually create lots of patterns pretty fast um, and decide which ones you like, which ones you don't. Um, and then as we showed earlier, you can basically do things like create sections out of it. So you can use you don't have to use these patterns in this kind of linear format. You can use them and use to select arbitrary patterns across here. So, so the although eight patterns seems quite limited initially, it's eight variations on um, a particular track. But also you've got so much variation abilities with things like chance and the FX that actually that's a lot of stuff. And then, of course, what we're doing here is we're only looking at one project. Okay, so now what I want to do is think about how we would extend this. Now, if I would 
traditionally be going into kind of things like lead lines now. So I'll be putting on different patterns, etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch back to performance mode up here. I'm going to ignore the sections, etc. for the moment. Um, now, one of the reasons I wanted to actually go through a whole project was basically I wanted to show some of the oddities. And here's something I didn't think of before. So you'll actually notice now I've actually got a uh, MIDI DIN cable plugged in. And the reason is MPE is going to actually use all 16 channels. So if I was sending it out via the USB here, I would have problems because these four tracks that I already have are going out over those channels and they would then start mixing with the MPE that I'm going to also be sending out. So what I've actually decided to do is quickly insert a MIDI DIN cable. Then what I'm going to do is to come into each of these tracks that I've got currently and I'm going to switch them to to uh, output A. So now that these will come over here and I've got it set up so that the instruments will now be through the MIDI DIN cable, which now means that I can actually go to track five. Let's get it out of this mode. Track five is going to be a MPE mode. So we hold step and shift the encoder and we can see this is an MPE mode. Now what we can do if we go to this setting here, we can actually see it's already recognized that it's MPE and we're going to be sending this over the USB device. Uh, now if I switch my controller over to something that's more MPE like, that's over here, that's, this is the one I want. Um, and now we should actually start hearing it. Yep, that's better. The MPE capabilities of this at the moment are pretty much for recording. It's going to be another firmware where they're going to actually change this so we can do a lot more editing. There are other things you can do. For example, you can apply effects and that kind of stuff. But um, the per note editing is not there at the moment. But um, this is good. We can uh, start anyway. So if we now start a track again. OK, we're coming to here. Perhaps what I'll do for MPE mode is I'll actually uh, use the looper mode. So rather than have a fixed length. So we're on track five. Press, uh, no, sorry. Press second settings is record settings. And we just switch on to recording mode. That's that's fine. The other thing I'm going to do is I know, is on the track settings, is I'm going to turn off the scale mode, um, because I don't really don't want that when I'm playing MPA. Okay, now let's think about, think about what I'm going to do. Okay, so all I'm going to do is just hit uh, record, and then it will start using the looping mode. stop that. Okay, so I've been talking a lot so far about all these different things that the Hapex gives you that allows you to create ideas, create variations. So we've got like the algorithms to create ideas. We've then got note chances and maths on it to alter things and spice things up. We've got effects, we've got automation, all these different ways of kind of getting different variations for us. So we end up with this space of kind of like these set of loops and variations. So this kind of gets us away from this idea of getting stuck in one particular loop or idea that we like. But where I think Apex really starts to score is that the next step is becomes quite simple. So basically, we've got all these patterns that we've done. And sure, like Ableton, we can kind of go through them and we can step through them. And that's all very nice. 
and that's grey. And so this is in the so-called performance mode here, where we're basically just able to live change things. And we've got this ability here to do sync. So this basically means when we actually change scenes or we select things, that happens on this sync bar. Um, so not only can we change like these kind of like rows, but we can also just randomly select different combinations. Let's get so it's doing it quicker so we can hear what's going on. Now, this, this actually leads us to the next section because what this means is that we can now play to see what combinations seem to work. So we start to get ideas about, okay, perhaps we'll start off with using just the, the base as the starting line perhaps, or perhaps with the percussion. Okay, so we'll use that and then we'll perhaps bring in these two then we might switch over to this one over here. And so we, we start to build up these ideas of what would go nicely together, etc. And this brings us on to what sections are. So rather than just being able to do like this scene kind of selection that we get in Ableton, what we can actually do is we can actually have arbitrary selections here. So we can basically say, OK, right, I want uh, Initially, these two are going to start. So I'm going to save that as a selection here. Um, and you can rename it. So I can say, OK, this is going to be my intro. OK, and then what we'll do is we'll go here. We'll have these two things. OK. Ah, so, so say section. OK, well, I won't rename this one. Um, Sorry, I launched it. So, ah, so, so what happened there is the, the nice thing here is that what you can actually do is when we're playing these, you can launch the sections by just literally pressing the encoder. You know? uh, so what actually happened there was I uh, so accidentally selected it. So what you need to do, we can change which is what's in this selection by basically saying, OK, I want these in this selection. And we press second and we edit and we go, OK, override that. So that's now section. The intro is these two. And this is kind of muted as we're down here. Then this brings in this section. And then we can go around and we can actually create lots of different variations. So basically, as we go along, we could we could already be thinking about arrangement, but we could also just be thinking about this as things that go nicely together. Um, so we might go here um, and then we might go say here. Uh, and we just find various combinations that we like. Now, you can actually then play it in this mode. So basically now we can just literally go between here and we can say I want to select these section of clips. I want these these patterns rather. <laughs> And so we, we can use this as a way to interact as well. Then once we've got that area, we've got this idea of what goes together. Then that naturally falls into, if we press down the pattern button again, into the song area where we basically now just literally list, OK, well, I'd like to do the intro for, for, 60, for a bar. I want to then to move on to section B. I'll do two bars of that. I might do four bars of D, for example. Uh, and then I want to do section C, whatever. And so now we've got a song mode. And so what, the way we use that is we simply switch this to song mode. We've got two different variations. We've got song play, which means it will just play once all the way through. Or we've got song loop. So basically go from the start to the end and then it will start again. Now this is quite interesting. OK, so it's now looping through these various sections I've got here. And we can actually tell it, oh, actually, I'll tell you what, I want to go back to that one. So we've got already a, 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 an ability to kind of like play with this order. And remember, of course, we might have assignments and stuff, so we could be playing with things. But we can also then go off to do things on our own. So for example, what we can do now is we could say, right, no, actually, I'm going to switch to performance mode. And now what this says is basically, it's going to carry on playing C, 
But I could then, if I wanted to, I could I, I could move back here to section mode and I could launch particular sections, or I could be launching these, or I could be just selecting individual clips. So we're here, and then I could basically say, okay, I'll tell you what, actually, I'm going to go a little bit more off-grid. I'm going to get a bit more experimental. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one. I'm going to come into five, and I'm going to snapshot the sequence. This was generated. And I'll tell you what, I'll get it to generate it again. I'll get generate something different. play with this so we've got all sorts of variations we could be doing things with modulation etc and then of course we know that I can just press the snapshot button once again and bang that's it I'm back to here and then we can basically go back here and say well, actually I tell you what now I actually want to go back to song mode and we'll see if we go back over here that it continues basically where it left on and obviously at some point I can say okay I've had enough Thank you very much. I've had, I'm off. Good night. So it's, it's a really kind of fluid and natural way. We've got this idea of basically how we can create variations um, within the kind of like the composition kind of side of it. Then we end up with building all these different variations and patterns on here. Um, and then we can naturally form this idea of, OK, well, let's kind of see which ones of those loops in inverted commas works. Um, and I'll save those as sections. And then we can come to a period of like, OK, right. Well, now I've got these different ideas. I can include them in the song and arrange them. And of course, you could also have sections that you don't use in the song, but you could actually then just trigger manually by coming out, as I said, back into performance mode. So I really think that that side's really quite fun. OK, so we've got one project. We've got variations, etc. But there's still more. I mean, we've still got way more to do because we have two projects and these projects can run um, completely independently and can be loaded whilst the other one's running. So, for example, if we come into here, this is what we've got going. I can now go into project B and I can say I want to load a project. This is how we get to the, the segment. Now I'm actually loading up the same project, but it doesn't matter. OK, we can see that it's red. This means that this project is currently completely muted. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can transition between projects. Um, so I'm just going to show one. Uh, what I like to do is to first of all come into here and just mute these tracks in Project B and select also what patterns I want to play, which I might have saved along with the project anyway. So now what we've got is that nothing's going to happen when I unmute the project with Mutant Project. It's shown as B, which is basically saying all the tracks are muted. And now we've got a cool little feature. So if we come back to A, and what we'll say is that, for example, what we want to do is mute this track. We'll mute the percussion so we can hear it. Now we've got this funky bass thing going on, but what I'm going to do is now I'm going to actually bring in. Oh, well, what? Yeah, I'm going to bring in the second track. So what we're going to do is we're going to say mute, and I'm going to want to mute the bass track. I'm going to switch to Project B, and I'm going to unmute the bass track here, and I'm going to unmute the percussion. And as soon as I release the button. I've now got both projects running. I've got tracks three and four are running on project A and on project B they're muted. And now of course I can do the full switch over, for example, and I can basically say, well, okay, let's mute these two tracks and bring in these two tracks off this project. Again, using signal. And now I'm fully over to this project and you can see that all tracks are muted over here, which means that now this track can be loaded again. So now the thing about that is that obviously if you've got many different uh, tracks, many different songs in a set, you can just basically keep on rotating them. 
It also means that if you haven't got that requirement, or you can also play with this a bit more creatively, where, for example, um, you've essentially got almost 32 tracks, because these things can run in track project A and B can run in complete parallel. Obviously, though, if you're running the 32 tracks all at the same time, then you're not going to be able to load seamlessly because you haven't got um, another project, as it were, to be muted so that you can come in. So there's lots of different possibilities there. Finally, let's, let's just have a very quick look at the settings. So, I mean, really, a lot of these are fairly so explanatory. You've got um, synchronization inputs. So that means where, you, where are you getting your clock? You can get your clock, obviously, from, from another MIDI machine, or you can get it via CV. Um, we've got sync out so that similarly we can uh, send out the clock and transport onto various things, and again, including in, uh, CV. Um, a nice facility um, to decide whether or not the clock will be um, when you send out the sync, whether or not you'll stop the clock when the transport stopped. Quite often you do not want to do that, um, especially with Eurorack and things. Uh, miscellaneous settings. Uh, we have a metronome, uh, which I haven't even touched on. Uh, this is quite clever. The metronome actually can come out as, um, as a click on the CV track. So, or you or do it as um, MIDI as well. So, for example, if you come into here, I think it is, if I'm right, it's here. No, this is what, no, that's all the destinations you can send it to. I'm going to say, ah, I looked at the wrong thing, it's up here. <laughs> okay, so you can send out as audio onto the CV track. So that's quite cool. You could, if you, even if you haven't got Eurorack, you've still got a use for those CV outputs. Um, the screen brightnesses, um, that you can change all of the colouring systems, so that's quite cool. Um, then we've got uh, CV and gate um, things, and uh, whether or not, this is quite cool, whether or not what the pedal input, it's got two, basically the hot and cold input, so you can decide when you press the pedal whether it's going to record or play, restart, etc. Uh, MIDI, um, so we can basically f use this to filter out messages um, if we don't want them. And we've got MIDI through capabilities, so we can basically just be piping the, mes the messages through uh, the HAPEX without actually uh, processing them. Um, and then we can uh, save these settings, basically. Um, so there's not, not a huge amount of settings, really. Um, I mentioned very briefly, uh, these are the recording settings. Um, so we've got the ability to basically learn, so that's whether or not it's listening to keyboards or whatever coming on the input. Uh, to select the notes. We've got whether or not we're going to overdub. Uh, we've got the ability to punch in and punch out. Uh, we've got a looper in here. Uh, we've got a countdown on the recording, whether or not the metronome is on, um, and uh, whether or not the recording automatically turns off when it actually hits the end of the recording. What else have we got? Um, I think some of the things are, yeah, things like editing, for, for example, we can do things like copy things to different lanes. Uh, we can do things like move these around by using the little button down here. Uh, we can move them uh, up and down. That probably doesn't make any sense on a drum track. Uh, we can delete these things. As I said, you can either do, uh, you can do column selection. Oh, this seems to be different on here. Um, so for example, you can do column selection here, or you can get to a block selection by pressing this. Um, we've talked about snapshots, undo, redo. Uh, oh, I mean, there is this tons of stuff. For example, uh, so we've got the BPM button here, which we can obviously change the BPM, but we can also see this track elasticity feature here, which we can just come down to. This actually allows us to run all of the different tracks um, slower or faster than the BPM. So, for example, I can turn down track three to being basically 50% of the BPM, which obviously is showing over here equals 44 BPM. Or we can do the opposite. We can actually also speed it up. Effects, there are a load of effects as well, an arpeggiator, chance, uh, Euclid. So this basically, with a note that's held, it will actually form a Euclid sequence, filtering of notes, 
uh, harmonizer so this is actually adding extra notes on top we've got the lfo the lfo actually can have very many different rain forms things like random we can then choose different modes for it we can uh, decide where it goes to whether it goes to for example a cv out or whether or not it goes to modulate something else um, now what else have we got uh, randomizer so add randomization um, i haven't needed a scaler but because we're using a project scale but you can also actually select so it's actually fixed to oh no, okay no so you can actually change it at various different scales here's nice little graphics to tell you what it's going to do um, what else do we have oh and swing and so we can change the swing on it again some nice little graphics i mean this has all kind of changed a little bit from the way it was on pyramid because we've obviously got more display state we actually get much more indication of actually what these things are doing and we've got humanization and accents you can see they go i'm going to change the color as they as the accents change which is very nice oh and this i i absolutely adore this <laughs> cold mode i mean i just i think it's just fantastic so yeah to round up yeah hey packs i mean it's an extremely capable uh sequencer um i mean you've got lots of io on the back um as i said the live mode is actually very playable um which i, I think is, they've just got about, just about the right feel on these pads uh, they're not velocity sensitive um i mean if you're inputting steps you have to kind of you can set the th steps velocity here um and obviously here we can see what parameters are etc um but they're very playable um this whole step thing, the fact that now we've got chance and uh, basically step conditions and uh, things like roll which i haven't even shown okay so there are quite a lot of other little editing features which we can just have a quick look off at. i mean it's been going on for a while right now so for example we can do things like double sequences and half them uh, we can zoom in and out on these sequences to see them we can do things like scroll the uh, we hold the notes we can then scroll the notes up and down we can transpose them rather uh, we can also move them backwards and forwards in time um, we uh, can also do something which has been requested on the pyramid quite a lot which we can actually move into triplet mode by just holding down the two plus button sometimes yeah you never quite get it right and we can now see that we're actually in triplet mode um so that's good um we can also what else can we do oh, it just I mean, it really just goes on and on really um what else oh looping mode so for example we can do things like turn around and say i want to loop between this section and this section by just holding down the arrow keys here and then we select where we want the loop to start and we put, use the track numbers we can actually see it's doing it here and then we can select the end point by bringing that well we can see that it's got these kind of like gray areas where it's actually doing it and this can all be done real time i mean there's like this the sequencer can be playing if we just hold these two notes these two buttons down then that will get rid of the looping sequence but that can be really handy if you just want to work on a particular section um, that i think about it or at least that's all i can remember at this moment in time um, very powerful sequencer um lots of creative possibilities i mean it's great fun to use um it really is a, a machine that you could basically sit down and use a generator to kind of start ideas switch them around change the patterns use a bit of probability um and before you know it, you've got something going and then you've got all the facilities to actually be able to go in there fine-tune things and then start tweaking things with effects and modulation um, you've got a, a whole stack of outputs on it so you can link up a whole load of uh, hardware including Eurorack um, this uh, obviously this is a USB host uh, device cable so this actually just plugs straight into your computer if you want to use it with that to develop ideas so it's really very good so it's really good fun to do composition on with this generative side and the 
ability to fine tune. But I, what I really like is the fact that this whole kind of pattern system with the sections and the song, I mean, you can take these ideas that you've been developing kind of organically, and then you can go beyond the loop because you can create variations. You can then start naming sections. You can have as many different combinations of these as you want. And then once you've kind of got to that stage, then you can naturally just start arranging it in to the song format. And then performance. Great. Not only can you actually perform these sections manually if you wish to, or perform these patterns manually if you want to, but you can put it into loop mode, go through the song, and then just interrupt it quickly, put it into performance mode and then do something. And you can start having hands-on control with assignments. You can uh, do snapshots so that you can basically say, okay, right, this is my safe space. And then what you do is you basically can fiddle around with things. And if it all goes horribly wrong, you can press snapshot button and you're back to where you were. So. It's really been thought well through for both kind of sitting down to compose things and actually also getting into a, a proper song mode and then finally actually being able to perform it. And for that, it's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, and as I say, with the fact that you've got two projects that can run in parallel, that means you can quite easily do an entire set through this without actually going, OK, how am I going to transition, which can obviously be a problem. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's a long video. Uh, if you'd like to see more on the Hapax, I mean, I, um, I'm willing to do little bits. If you want to know specific things about it, um, then just put a comment in the, the video and um, I'll see if I can get to it. Have a nice day and see you soon.